I knew there were a lot of reformers and I thought, oh my God, what am I going to find? Could I find people from the family? Could I find the names of my friends? This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app so that you don't miss a single episode. What is it like to be under secret police surveillance? On the 10th of March 1983, 12-year-old Carmen Bugan returned from school to find Romanian secret police in her living room. Her father's protest against the regime had changed her life forever. In recent years, Carmen gained access to the files of the Romanian secret police. She herself is surprised by the intimacy of the surveillance. Forgotten conversations, love letters, arguments are all laid bare via the detailed notes taken by the Securitate. We hear the sadness of discovering friends and family members were involved in informing on them too. Carmen and I discuss the language of oppression, the subtle and not-so-subtle methods used to try and ensure a compliant population but still thwarted by humanity even in the darkest recesses of the Romanian prison system. It's a warning from history and the meaning of freedom in current times. Cold War history is disappearing, but a simple monthly donation will keep this project going and allow me to continue preserving these incredible stories. You'll join our community, get the sought-after Cold War Conversations drinks coaster as a thank you, and bask in the warm glow of knowing that you're helping to preserve Cold War history. Hi, this is Tree from Berlin. I decided to support Cold War Conversations with a monthly subscription for a couple of reasons. I believe it's so important and interesting to hear these stories from that period, good and bad. Books will tell you so much, but the real-life stories from people who were there make it so real. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. Alternatively, you can help us by sharing us on social media and telling your friends. It really helps us get new guests on the show. I'm delighted to welcome back Carmen Bugan to our Cold War conversation. My father, Ion Bugan, had difficulties with the communist government in Romania from the 1960s. And he served seven years in prison before meeting my mother. Um, in 1969, he met my mother. Um, they were married very quickly, and I was born in 1970. And here's where the story of um, the childhood under the secret police, under the eye of the secret police, uh, begins for me. My father was a political dissident. My mother was persecuted because she married um, and she because she stayed with a political dissident. She didn't really know at the beginning that my father was a political dissident. She found out when she was called for her first interrogation soon after the marriage. And during the Ceausescu era um, in the 1980s, when there were shortages, they bought uh, a typewriter uh, illegally. They um, spread uh, anti-communist propaganda all over Romania and uh, buried the typewriter in a backyard. My father was arrested uh, following a public protest against Ceausescu on 10 March 1983. And uh, from that day on, uh, we lived under 24-hour surveillance until 1989 when we left the country. So that's the background of the story. I mean, I suppose um, if I were to make a portrait of, of the family uh, during that time, the biggest part of that portrait for me was really seeing the house when aged 12, I was 12, really seeing the house fill up with people with leather coats and and, in sort of briefcases and asking me a lot of questions, having my first interrogation. Later on, um, I've written a poem called Portrait of a Family once I learned English, and that talks about that particular day and the experience of seeing the family breaking up. Um, with the secret police. And could we hear that that poem, Carmen? 
I will read this. When the strangers walked into the house, took the paintings off the walls, and sealed off the rooms with red wax, part of this poem listened in a hospital. A woman's milk fed the words she couldn't say into her child's mouth. For seven months, the strangers stayed in the house. Someone tied the hands of the man who inflamed the center of the capital with protest while they took the paintings off the walls. A few lines cowered in the grass outside the windows with the neighbors who watched the girl answering questions to the strangers who settled into the house. And yet, someone followed her sister on the streets and photographed her pure black eyes, unsuspecting in the paintings on the walls. Now that the strangers have left the house, the poem would like to know, can it place once more the paintings on the walls? Will the sun tell the secrets of his mother's milk? Will the handcuffs come off the man's hands? Will the girl stop answering questions? Will her sister burn the photographs? So I suppose in this poem, I'm, I'm asking the question, if the language of poetry can heal the damage of history and, and can put back the family, my own family. And this has been an effort that has been my work for the last 30 years of writing in English. Incredible. Thank, thanks so much for uh, reading that, Carmen. Really appreciate that. The the reason you're you're back with Cold War conversations is to talk about the secret police files which you've had access to, and one of the the first question I wanted to ask you is, when you were told that you could get access to these files, were you reluctant to actually look at them for fear of what you might discover in them? Yes. Um... I was terrified. I was both elated and terrified. I remember receiving the letter and, and I received access to the files just as I finished bearing the typewriter and the book was being prepared for publication. So the book was already written. What was really um, shocking about that feeling I had first, about, you know, seeing the files, what if I got some things wrong? in my book. So I was, you know, first looking for confirmation because I know that people were looking. That's a story that I told in a book. My, my father buried a typewriter. And I remembered the interrogation and I remembered him burying it. And I remember really being so scared that my grandmother's slippers, you know, when we were looking at the ground. But then when I found the picture, it was an incredible moment of saying, see, it's true. That was because the, the story seemed, you know, almost too incredible, even to my publishers, in a sense. You know, wow, you know, this really happened. Yes, it really happened. But I was very apprehensive because I, I you know, I knew there were a lot of informers and I thought, oh, my God, what am I going to find? Could I find people from the family? Could I find the names of my friends? Would I know what happened to my father when they interrogated him? Um, so I was really um, mortified in a sense. And then, of course, I had my own things, right? During the five years that we were under um, interrogation, I have had my own experience and I said my own mean things about my father and my mother around the house. And, um, and I said all the, all the cursing words that you can imagine that somebody says, despite all of the... Um, self-censorship despite all of the silence um, and I and I thought Ooh, ha, am I going to see pictures of myself in embarrassing situations for example am I going to hear 
you know, w- you know, things when, when I'm blaming people for it. Am I good? Are my, the fights with my sister, are they going to, I mean, this is stuff that, you know, you want to forget. You said that you want to forget. Is it part, is it going to be part of it? So that was that very strong uh, moment of apprehension. But then at the same time, I thought, okay, I have to go back there. I have to go back there because now there is the record. And I really want to see what they said. I'm also very curious. My father had a completely different attitude. He didn't want them. He said, well, I know who I am. Who needs? That's junk. You know, enjoy yourself if you want. I'll give you my signature that you're allowed to see them. But I don't care. My mom was more on my side. She said, I'll go with you to be a crest. Yeah, we'll go together. We'll go. And, you know, sweaty hands and everything, you know, flights. And, and we went there to the, to the library. What was it like the first time you opened this and you, you saw something that, well, it's almost like an echo of 20-odd years ago in these musty pieces of paper recording your life from what I can make out in really intimate detail. I mean, every conversation and these secret police officers interpreting your words in in certain ways, trying to think about what your emotions were. I mean, it's it's incredibly intense the level of surveillance. How, how did you find that when you, you first started digging into those files? Well, so first there was the sort of, when we went to the library at the Center for the Archival Research there, there was, you know, the building itself was quite beautiful. And, you, you know, you sit as you would sit in any library. So that was sort of removed from from normalcy in a sense um because it wasn't some kind of dingy place where you go and you expect to find bad stuff about yourself but it was you know very nice sort of place where they they bring the files to you with a glass of water um and then we found ourselves my mother and i just flipping through the pages and um being totally shocked. Oh, God, that conversation. Oh, look at that picture. Oh, that's from that year. To my surprise, all of the details of my adolescence, complete with love notes I wrote to boys, thinking one will never read, I mean, nobody else would read them other than them. I mean, the notes I, you know, even hid from my mother. This is, this is, you know, they've been faithfully recorded in my mother's archive. First we saw my father's and then my mother's. My yearly letter to my father in prison and his postcards to us, the conversations my father had with the man in his cell, all are recorded and sometimes paraphrased, and the transcripts of our dreams that we, you know, we talked about dreams in the morning, and then they were recorded there. So, um, these come together with notes about further monitoring, with further instructions, uh, written on the side of the page, sort of follow up on this and follow up on that, um, and glosses about the, our state of mind. You know, this is underlined. Uh, th- th- there were instances where the emotional states were there. Imagine two things. Imagine sort of being a bird pecking at the ground and seeing the seeds <clears throat> and the grass, right? This is what you see. But with these files, imagine being that bird sort of soaring up and seeing everything from a larger perspective. So it gave me this view from above. There's my father in prison in Ayud or in the interrogation room in Rahova. There's my mother in a hospital making calls in a village to the elementary school teacher saying, is Carmen okay? Is she alive? Is she home? I, I, I'm, I am, my mom is recorded saying, I'm like a fish out of the water. I can't breathe. I don't know what's up. What about the other daughter? Can somebody please go and find my children and call me back? And then, of course, these teachers are not allowed to call her back anymore. The, the conversations are shut up there, so she wouldn't come in contact with them. And then there is the house inventory 
with absolutely everything down to every single pair of shoes and every single, um, you know, bottle of sunflower oil that is in a house, all of it being recorded. Um, so I did get that sense of looking globally at the story, as it were. But then at the same time, psychologically, there was a very unnerving period. Um, I remember at the time when I was reading the files, I was recording a program for the BBC, and they gave me this recorder just to get my um, reaction to different files. And I was in France living at that time uh, with my very young children, and I was, you know, in a kitchen late at night reading the files and crying into the microphone and just saying, oh, my God, I can't believe this. Um, they're actually talking about my brother crying in his sleep, you know, that, 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 that kind of stuff. So it was very uh, strange to, to, to read those. Suddenly there was another reality. Um, I mean, I suppose that there are two aspects of my experience here. The first aspect is, Yes, I'm the daughter of these political dissidents. My father was physically taken to prison. My father was, or my mother was physically held in a hospital. We were pulled out of school. Were we were interrogated? Okay, and now I lived, and I can tell the story. But then the files, once I read them, and and over the years, they made me understand this the mechanism of oppression, how those acts were enacted in language and through language. And um, this, is, this is precisely the, the effect of surveillance on ordinary citizens that is, um, I suppose, immortalized in all these files of all these people from Eastern Europe during the Cold War, that, that personal, that... Um, also, there are different kinds of files. I mean, I can tell you about the different the, the categories of them. You know, there were the files of my father recorded in the Ayud prison and how many days of prison he has to execute as a prisoner and um, what he said to his friends there. You know, if I come out alive, he said at one point, you know, I'm going to buy myself a bottle of wine on a train and some ham, and that lasts me all the way home. You know, these conversations were there. That was the first time he was arrested. I found the file, which is so endearing. You know, they found an empty bottle of beer, um, a pocket mirror, um, two um, light bulbs for flashlights. You know, these are the things that they confiscated and they, they had to get provisions and where to keep them, where which members of the family would keep them, will store them till he's he, till he returns from prison. So those are those prison files, those documents. You know the beatings that he took, the solitary confinement, how many days, and and you know how many kilograms of chains. Okay, were were un, put on him. Then there were the files about the correspondence. The, the postcards that we sent to each other to prison in the 1980s, some of them are copied out. Some of them are re rephrased. And they're just sort of, they wanted to give the gist of what we said in those postcards. So I have now a, a, a file. I have a file here with, you know, with the correspondence here. And it's, you know, written beautifully in their, you know, in their hand letter. So the effect on me, I mean, I've become sort of friends with this handwriting because they knew, they knew about, about my life. And then there are files about all quarters. The man who is in charge of the woods outside the village, that man who brought wood to my mother in exchange for, I don't know what, eggs from the hands or something, that forester was tasked to talk to her about my father, and he was monitored um, in order to record for her, but he was also monitored so he would be monitored in turn, okay? So, so the informer 
had to be controlled to make sure that the informer doesn't slip any kind of hint that, hey, I'm spying on you. Uh, so there were those uh, work orders in there. And then there were the conversations that we've had on a phone, that those were the transcriptions and the conversations that we've had in a house. So there are all these levels um, that make a very intricate language of surveillance, which, which was behind the simple uh, uh, gestures of us not being able to find friends somehow, or not being able to find a job for my mom were not receiving each other's letters from prison. So in this sense, they've been really illuminating for me. So they were recording audio and then transcribing it into the files. Is that how they were capturing all these conversations and and details? Yes, this is how they were doing this, yes. And, and I've asked for the tapes, when I was there and they said, you know, some have been destroyed. Actually, some also they've been re-recorded once they've been transcribed. They've been recorded over to save um, to save the tapes. And some we, we still don't have access to. I mean, there's some visual and some audio material that we still don't have access to. You know, we just have to live with the fact that, you know, they might never find them where they, they were saying that they don't have enough staff to actually sort through all the material for people. So what I have is um, photocopies of transcripts that have been entered and dated and numbered in there. There are many of the um, uh, many of the things are missing though. Uh, there are gaps, and so what happens is uh, it's a it's a very strange sort of surreal memory experience that I have with. This month, we knew that something was happening in a family, but they haven't recorded it, or why they haven't recorded it. Where they mentioned uh, one of the grandfathers, but then they stopped or they blocked some things. And this makes me think, was actually Boniko Nekulai, was he part, was he asked to give information? Why is that part blocked? So there is, you know, um, redacted, that there are, there are several senses. One, at one point, the files confirm memory. Yes, this happened, and we remember this. Painful as it is, it confirms it. There was a visit to my father to prison. There was, there is the, the record that says, I did something, but I don't have a memory of it. So there is a transcript of me visiting my father in prison. It's called an audience of... Uh, with his daughter, and I have no memory of that. I was 17. Um, I have no memory of that. And so that makes me question, What is there something wrong with my memory? Have I blocked it out? Where? What was everybody else? Why am I alone there talking to him? So that's another thing. And then there is um, the other part where they recorded people in the house when I wasn't there. So it's like discovering something new, what happened in my absence, what happened to the family life in my absence. And, and one of the most fascinating ones is a transcript of my father reciting poetry to my brother just mm. after his return from prison. Um, and it's a, it's a transcript that I talked about um, in, in my book, Poetry and the Language of Oppression, because I, I just I just found it really shocking is is a recording made on February 12, 1988. This is just my father came I think on the eighth, uh, 1988, and uh, he's he has this conversation. Shall I read you my translation of the file? Yeah, yeah, and no, I'd be really interested because I think it would be interesting just to hear that the level of detail that there is in these files. Yeah, so it starts with, with the date and the indexing by the time and who's doing the recording and the transcribing. And then we had a code name for the family. We had several code names, but the code name for the conversations in the house was Barbu, okay, the name Barbu, in quotation marks. And at the top of the file, it says to pay attention to this one. We're monitoring this one. And then it says, hour 6 a.m., in the room, the objective, 
who is my father, listens to the news from Radio Free Europe. The children sleep. He is listening by himself. At 7.35, Carmen leaves the house. Then ellipsis, dot, dot, dot. After that, so time passes. The objective is reciting the following verses to his son. And here are the verses, and they are by a very famous Romanian uh, poet. Let us not by the will of the holy God crave blood instead of land. When we will reach the end of patience, everything by turn will end. All right. Son, that's my little brother, five-year-old brother. Is this all? <laughs> Father, uh, I no longer know this poem. I like to live alone, not with people, because I do not trust them. Son, is this what you mean by loneliness? Father, yes. I mean, reading this 25 years on, as I've become a poet shaped by my father's typewriter, by my mother's hospital uh, months with my little brother, and, and, and by the experience, it was a moment for me um, that was staggering in itself. First of all, my father doesn't recite a lot of poetry. So it was a knowledge into him. Second was, I've learned that my brother learned what loneliness means by the experience of talking to my father. It wasn't a word that he's learned at school. As you learn it, you know, here's a, the word lonely. It means, you know, a bear with no friends or something. Uh, so that deep connection, and this is what I want to, I'm so aching to talk about this with everyone. The experience, the relationship between experience and language is so, so deep. And I, and I suppose the language of surveillance makes it so plain in here because it captures an intimate moment that most of us would have forgotten. But for Catalin at that age to understand loneliness before he knows what the words what the word means, it's just extraordinary, in any case, in, for a poet to know that, that we are so connected to the words and words themselves are who we are, 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 are our identity. Yeah, so, so the Securitate had captured the exact moment that your little brother learned what loneliness or what the word loneliness meant yes you wouldn't want that level of surveillance but to have that moment captured must be quite precious yeah for sure this is one of the finds right that you always i mean i said that my book poetry and the language of oppression is a is an incursion you know mm. you raid and then you come with the booty this is this is this is my war now you know that's i'm raiding that language of surveillance and this is a trophy that I'm coming back with, that moment of, of learning and of the connection between experience and language of how they become one and the same. Um, so there is that sense of real discovery that there is, you know, in a sense, you know, you're glad that the record exists. And the reason you're glad for it is because you know you cannot erase it. I mean, if it was possible to erase everything, I would prefer to have it all erased and go on with my life. But knowing that this would be there forever, I'm glad then that there are these moments in there because there is something for me to take. There is, there is something for me to discover. It does feel a bit like looking, you know, through a keyhole, into your own life. And that's weird. That's really weird. I mean, because, you know, most of us like to think that, well, I know my life. So, and I know my secrets and I know my, my sort of shameful moments where I know my tender moments and they're mine and I own them. But it's another thing to sort of look through these and read through this in, into a keyhole in your own life. And you're thinking, but that's somebody else where that's somehow these two people belong to me. They have 
such the surveillance and the, this language of surveillance, this intimate observation of the person, almost anatomical, the way they've made it um, look, it has an effect of displacing one from oneself. It really messes up with your identity. It's, it makes me very sort of tentative. I have to check against the files if what I remember is, is, is exactly the way. I have to, to say that everything that I account now, I have to double check it. Not because that I'm afraid that I'm lying, but because I'm afraid that what if I misremember something? And then when I find that there lies in the, fi- in the files, I can't turn back against them and say, well, that's a bloody lie. You can't make up that stuff. You can't, you have no right to make up that stuff. That's not, that's not what I said. And that's not what I meant. And, and, you know, as well as feeling violated, you know, finding out, you know, uncles and cousins who are informers, you know, you feel like I really would prefer not to know that because I love these people a lifetime. I don't really want to even know that. And I guess it's, it's also their interpretation as well. It's like, you know, history is somebody else's interpretation of things that happened. And in the same way, even with this surveillance, even with the intimacy of the surveillance, it's still their interpretation of what they think you're thinking or what you're saying or what you're expressing at that moment. Yeah, I mean, here's here's another really good example of it is um, I keep returning over and over to the night my father came back uh, from prison and to that transcript because it's so illuminating in so many ways. My memories that I recounted in Bearing the Typewriter are all you have there. And they're not, there isn't a whole lot in there that I was able to pull through um, just through the act of writing. I wasn't able to sort of dig it all out the way, but the file, oh my God. It has him looking for his shaver, for his radio, talking about different things. And, and I wanted to put out, again, something that has to do with me, is he, the, this is a transcriber talking about my father coming home. And so here is where the transcriber, who's working with this recording, is sort of redacting this. It said that I cried uncontrollably. And I accused a state of psychological uh, distress or shock. Um, but then when I came back to my senses, I demonstrate respect in speech towards my father. And demonstrate respect in speech is underlined on a file. That is an important... How would they know? How would they... Sometimes they say from the tone of voice, from the tone of voice, okay. And I would imagine there were great literary critics and great observers because they would have known also from the diction, from the choice of words. They would have known that I've addressed my father by vous, the French vous, rather than by tu. They would have known that I used, and in fact, it's not really the French vous as much as it is sort of the, the old the old village tradition of calling your father matale, which is similar to the French vu. So they would have noticed that. Similarly, they, they have files in which they transcribe me as using you, too, with my father, which I haven't used once since I was born. And this is where I'm taken back and I'm thinking, you're making that up. You can't possibly do that. To pretend that you were so, so, so detailed and so anatomical about this, and yet, at the same time, to have me talk in that tone of voice, in that, in that register, which I would have never used. Yeah? So these are the conflicts that it sort of stirs. It sets your soul at war. That's what it does. It's me, it's not me. It's me, it's not me. You know, there's elements in there which are verbatim, but there's other areas in there where they're trying to create a narrative that they presumably think they're, you know, the people above them want to hear about you. 
Yeah, there is. And and in fact, I I have a file about that. Um, and and it's, it's something that I would really like to, to tell you about because it's, it's quite interesting. Again, about a week after he came from prison, my father started receiving death threats on a phone and th- there were interesting, interesting calls. And so he goes to the local police station and he says, you know, I served my time. I served my punishment. I am corrected. I will not do that kind of stuff again. Would you please not kill me? And then the policeman says, what are you talking about? And he says, well, I received death threats. Um, again, now, the way this is told with the notes to give it to the chief at the district to read this um, is told as if my father is making it up as an excuse for him not to find the job. The reason for this is to arrest my father again as a parasite. The parasitism was very big during the Cold War. If you are a persona non grata, if you were somehow um, undesirable because of your political views, and if you didn't have work, then you would be arrested as a parasite. Okay, now nobody, you know, within a few days offered my father a job, but he did receive death threats. So my father said, you know, can you let me live? And they were saying, well, he just doesn't want to go to work, you know, because he's afraid if I get out of the house, what will happen to me? Then there is another one, which is even darker, Ian. And this is something that brings me to a particularly personal experience that I don't really want to talk all all about it. But there is a threat made against the children. Um, A man calls from Bucharest asking my father to meet with him. My father says, well, I'm not uh, that kind of person. Well, he said, no, I want, to, I, I want to get some information from you. It's, it's important. You, you, you need to meet with me. So my father understood the threat. That must have been Securitate posing probably as somebody from Amnesty International or from, from the West trying to extract information about his prison time. So he said, no, thank you. But then the man turns around and he says, I understand that you love your children very much, don't you? And my father says, of course. And the man says, and you're still not coming to meet me. My father says, no. And this sets off a whole set of phone calls between the family that is recorded. Between my mother and me and my sister. Be careful. Don't go anywhere. It was clear there were threats against us that were made against him. My father went back to the secret police and he said, I received this phone call. Why are my children involved? Why did the man ask me if I love my children? What are you going to do to my children? And he is recorded again as being somebody completely ridiculous making up this stuff. So there is, you know, um, for a while I was making jokes. and I think, well, these are great Shakespeare plays, right? You know, there is a trap of a trap, of a trap, of the trap. But then I'm thinking, if you were to study the psychology of people who went under surveillance 25 years later, and there are millions of us, and if you ask us, what's your view of government? And if we would say, well, you know, I have my feelings about it. I'd rather not talk about it. Um, you'd be like, wow, you know, you, you really should be a bit more easy about life. You should, you should trust. We, we, we live in a good world. And we, we don't. We don't. There is that suspicion of, uh, of authority because now reading these files, I realize all these traps over traps over traps that we didn't even know then. So in a sense, I suppose also the, the secret police files everywhere should be studied for this language of, of trapping people into confessing stuff that they didn't do, trapping them into feelings a certain um, way, you know, helpless, uh, so that we know how oppression is enacted 
in language itself. It's 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 its own narrative, I suppose. That you know, maybe this is not what they wanted to have, but now that we can study it, we realize this. Oh, you make people feel that way. You, you know, you call them, you threaten their kids, and then you say nobody did it. And that technique I hear in in other interviews that sort of psychological technique of you know if you don't do this something will happen to somebody in your in your family but also that technique of sort of trying to make you think that you've imagined you actually had that conversation by saying to you well you know we're we're not doing this I don't know who it is but it's not us you know what would make you know make you think you're going a bit mad with with some of this stuff and it's just this immense pressure on your father after he's been through you know solitary confinement in prison and all of the you know the hardships that he's had there that even when he is technically released although he's effectively under house arrest he's still being harassed and they're still playing games with him I guess I'm I'm trying to understand here is they could arrest him again at any time. So they don't really need a pretext for that. Yeah, I mean, they they don't. And then they do. They have to write something that this person is behaving in this way. This person, they would still have to justify it to themselves. If you look at these files, another thing that you would see is... Um, a very strong backbone of justifications. There are certain characterizations of my father and of my family uh, that led them to believe that he is a dangerous element, that he is, uh, you know, uh, an obstinate person, that he is this and the other thing. And I also think, to be honest with you, I also think a lot of it has to do with them being bored, trying to keep themselves employed, And some of them just enjoying doing games because they could. There is a sense to me of the human character coming out at at its worst in certain uh, uh, files. Do you know? There's almost sadistic kind of stuff, you know. So they're toying with you. They're they're playing, yeah. But, I mean, it's, it's the kind of playing that has my father utterly confused about where to go. There is somebody who asks somebody who asks somebody else to ask him Which way are you returning from work when he eventually got a job? By the train station or by the bus station? Are you taking the bus or are you taking the train? Now, my father came home and he told my mother, I don't know why people keep asking me if I'm taking the train or the bus home. Why do you think they're asking me? And here I want to give you a love moment. It's extraordinary what I found in this file. And it just, to me, is, you know, God, I love my parents. She said, from now on, I'm going with you every day to the railway station, and I'm going to wait when you come off of the train. So you go with me. Now, this is my mom who's been under surveillance and suffering because of him and fighting with him and honestly, a lot of times, you know, saying to him, I really, really hate you for what you did. But, you know, this is you put me through the worst of my life. Right. So there were those fights in there. And this is the same woman who says, but you come with me. That little, I mean, she was like, you know, four foot nine, something like this, you know, distressed and, and, you know, just, oh, I'm going to protect you with my body. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to walk with you and I'm going to take you. And my father takes strength from her. I wrote a poem about that in, in releasing the porcelain birds um, because I had that sense of <sighs> triumph. They're standing up for each other. They know, you know, and this wasn't my father being paranoid. Now that I see it in the files, maybe at the time it seemed to them, it seemed to him or to her, am I losing my mind? Am I being paranoid? Uh, I wondered myself as a a young girl, as you know, not so young, at the age of uh, 17, 18, 19, when I left, You know, I was wondering myself, you know, am I being, am I being, is everybody suspicious in my life? And and I'm always going to sort of hate being with people because I don't trust anybody at all. But then to find out all all these things, to find out, oh, 
there were people who had code names just to follow my feelings about my father, then maybe I wasn't so crazy after all. I mean, that's another takeaway from the from the files. You you mentioned a little while earlier about an uncle. So did did you discover from the files that there were some family members who were conspiring with the secret police to gather information on you? Yes. The one who moved me the most was uh, my mother's sister's um, husband. He was the loveliest um, uncle. He was, I mean, he was the one who, you know, taught us how to dance to Elvis before we left the country. He was the one who shared his uh, poetry journals from when he was a teenager, 15, 16. He shared them to me when I was that age. He... um, It's very interesting. I remember the time when I was very young and he came on a first visit with my aunt to our house in Draganesht. I remember that day very well. They both wore leather coats, (laughs) not because they were secret police, but they had leather coats. He had a brown one, she had a black one. And they came in and my parents were taking a nap and my parents told my sister and me, you go play outside. Don't you dare come into the house. We are busy taking a nap. So we're going to close the curtains, close the door. We're busy. Now you go play on the street and anybody who ever comes in here, you tell them we're taking a nap. And so sure enough, you know, a little while later, my in Romania, people often, often made at that point, we didn't have a phone. So people made surprise visit. They would just sort of get on a bus, go for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour on a bus and visit. So they came to the gate and my sister and I stood with them at the gates and we made sure that they left and they didn't get inside the house. And we were so proud of ourselves. So I remember that for being so proud of myself that I protected my parents' nap. Okay. Fast forward 35 years later, right? Because I would have been like eight, nine, 10 at that time when my parents were napping. Okay, so fast forward, I'm reading the files. My uncle shows into the files. And he writes in the most gentlemanly language, saying uh, an account of my first encounter with the objective. I went with my wife to their domicile. Domicile. In Draganesht. But the two daughters did not let us go see them. (laughs) So I found that, you know, um, but I, I promise that I will go and seek out more information about the background of the objective. On another file, he is recorded as talking to my parents um, about various stuff. And by the time we left, we used to take the calls from the American embassy at their apartment, thinking that maybe they're not bugged. But all the transcripts came through. And then, you know, so we kept moving. We kept taking calls from people and from the embassy at different uh, people's houses who were friends, who were friends of friends, were, and everybody was bugged. That's another thing, too. Like, there are people actually whose names I don't remember. Uh, in association with my parents, I don't remember. But I know that my mother was there, you know, in, in, you know, November 1988, taking a call from somebody there in relation to my father. Uh, so there was, and especially her conversations before the divorce were taken at different places um, at friends and families, and those phone conversations were, were transcribed. Because of the divorce, what she was trying to see, she was trying to figure out if by agreeing to divorce him, it would be possible for her to ask that they bring him to the town or to the village so we actually know that he exists for real because we've been told that he killed himself um, in prison, that, you know, different accounts, handle of a spoon or he strangled himself or something. So we wanted to make sure that he was alive. So my mother was having all these conversations outside the house where the microphones couldn't catch her, but all of them were recorded. So that was uh, the thing. But my uncle really, I mean, we went um, and we 
you know, he died um, several years ago, but in 2013, I think he died, 2014. Last I saw him was 2010. And um, it was a very strange experience, you know, to, to go back to the house um, when he was dead and sort of look at his pictures on the walls and remember the uncle I had. And then remember the person in the file who volunteered very clearly. Then I talked to my mom about this and, you know, she said, honestly, he's done it to protect us. That there were also people in the family, there was another, somebody else in the family who had said to me later on, um, listen, I've done this because I knew that if I volunteer to go to give information about the family, I choose what I tell them about you. And I'll be okay. I won't be punished because I don't serve. And you won't be punished because I will just say stupid things about you. Um, I just say bullshit about you. And then this way you're, you're, you're under surveillance. And so they don't need to send somebody else. So there was also that game going on. But it's been, um, it's been a bit strange. I mean, you know, I write in my second memoir, Life Without a Country, about going back and visiting people one by one in their houses after I read the files where they talked about us or where they recognized that they specifically shunned us. They, they just really avoided us for years. And I went and I met with them and, you know, I didn't tell them about what I knew about them, but I put in a book, sort of the file and then the meeting, um, you know, not all of it, but, you know, enough to give people a sense that, you know, they're, everybody had a double identity and you can't live. If you don't have an integrated self, you can't really be sane and you can't live and you cannot have a healthy family, a healthy life, a healthy society. You just can't. I mean, this is a damage done by surveillance. That's what I'm trying to say here. And we were talking about this earlier before we started recording, but it's almost like a post-traumatic stress syndrome in, in so much that even though it's 30 years after you experience that surveillance, you, you still are mistrustful of people even to today sometimes. So it's a, it's a different kind of thing, you know, here, but I tend to be very sensitive now of um, anything that has to do with self-control of the language, with uh, anything that has to do with the, the political rhetoric, you know, um, mission statements and stuff like this. There is something very, the policing part of the person comes back very strong mm. uh, for me. It was eye-opening to go from the experience in Romania to come to the United States. And I think the most shocking experience for me was to go to a policeman and say that I need help with directions where I need help because, you know, I'm scared of something or my car broke. When I grew up with the policeman, as could, could he harm us in some way? Could, could he kill us? Could he take away my parents? Could he? So that trust in, in authority has been completely destroyed. So I had to get used to that. But even, even today, I, I'm always sort of stopping and I'm asking myself, what's behind your question? What are you really trying to get at? Um, and I don't like that. Um, that's the, the reason I wrote uh, poetry and the language of oppression is because I have also found a way to work very hard with his words, like I was saying about the word loneliness, about my brother, to work very, very hard with the etymology of the words in my own experience, yeah, and to write myself free, to get this expressive language of poetry that would allow me to say, I have every right, as everybody else, to feel who I want to be, you know? Of course, the muddy part is, well, who do I want to be? Because I have so much knowledge about how people are deceitful to one another. It's very difficult. I, you meet anybody from, uh, anybody from the Romanian community, everybody from, you know, Eastern Europe here, everybody remembers the surveillance, remembers the suspicions, 
People just prefer to keep to themselves. Sometimes they avoid each other um, and they sort of prefer to take everything with a grain of salt. Um, and that's not accidental. I don't believe that's accidental. Have you ever met any of the Securitate people that were keeping an eye on you or have you ever attempted to meet them? No. See, that's something I would not want to do. I mean, I have some of their names here um, and I preserved some some of the names. But I would I know Timothy Garton Ash did when he wrote the file about himself. For me, it's way too traumatic. And I really wouldn't want, I wouldn't have anything to say to a person like that. I wouldn't pretend to ask a person like that, but what were you thinking? And really that person to come up with a coherent answer. So I, I wouldn't want to go there because there is still that rawness ab- about it. I mean, we, you know, I have nothing against them. I mean, I wouldn't want to go chase them. I wouldn't want to go expose them. I wouldn't want to go and put them on trial. I don't actually believe in that. But what I wanted to do is to understand the language that they used in order to protect myself and to protect my own children against mistrust, if that makes any sense. Mm. Because I think when you, when, you, when you are infected with this mistrust, when you, when you are incapable of really letting go and living your life to the fullest, um, this is when you, when you actually miss it all. It's, it, it's not this. So for me, part of that is really looking and understanding that language doing the service of sort of doing the research, talking about it, um, thinking about it, creating um, with it, exposing it for what it is, so that when it surfaces in other, in other contexts, people can understand, ooh, that is the language of oppression. That is um, a way by which people take control over other people. And so therefore, we can develop tools to work against that language. So I'm not interested with particular players. I'm not interested with Bachu or whoever, the, 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 the ones who are the notorious ones in our case, uh, who humiliated us. But what I'm interested in is in the apparatus that they used. Um, well, I think that and it's funny because the word apparatus is is one of the ones that stands out with me in in one of the sentences in the in the book that I picked out, which was, you know, you say that the apparatus of betrayal made victims of everyone. Yeah, so I wouldn't really. This is what I'm trying to say. When when uh, the man who brought my mother would was tasked to, to survey her, but then there is a file that has an order for somebody else to say, we need to survey him to make sure that he does the job. He is as much as a victim of that as my mother. Mm. And the suspicion at the higher levels, I suspect, was worse than our suspicion as sort of the the basic victims. You know, we were the primary material, but I think the secondary material over there, you know, the people who turned all the gears in there, they were more damaged, I believe, than us. More damaged um, psychologically because they were somehow brainwashed into doing something that goes against human nature um, they were infected with a kind of ideology that allows people to harm other people. So ideology is very important as part of the apparatus here of, uh, of oppression, you know. Um, and uh, so I, I, I really do believe that those, they were just as much as victims. And when I think about, you know, what... Sometimes I sit and I imagine, what are they doing for a living? Are they bored and they're trying to work in surveillance in other contexts? Are they chasing some of their victims for fun to check out to see what what they've done with their lives? Um, Have they taken up gardening or something? I mean, it's, it's, you know, you do wonder 
a, a life spent observing and studying somebody not for the right reasons um but for all the wrong reasons must do something to you that is just as damaging as well it's not just a life spent studying it's a, it's a life spent ruining other people's lives you said it there i mean it's the the moral compass that has been completely destroyed at the moment when one signed uh like my uncle you know to read those was shattering for me when you sign a declaration that you will serve and you will inform on this person and you engage yourself to tell everything you say about this person you know that somehow both goes against your nature and you know that you you're also doing something that is directly harmful you know so it goes both against i mean you could harm <laughs> You could harm, um, let's say, a deer because you kill it and you eat it. That's a kind of harm. But you could harm a person because you want to sort of, I don't know why. There are many reasons to survive yourself, to protect yourself, to protect your family because you're too, too much of a, a coward. Or, you know, I don't like really throwing away the word coward. But, you know, there, there, there are reasons for which people don't have the strength to say no. Imagine, I mean, I'm wondering, yeah, if, if everybody who was asked, every ordinary person in Eastern Europe during the Cold War, who was asked to sign those declarations and to join sort of the lowest ranks is, you know, if my neighbor next door and the other neighbor next door where we knew that the secret police slept and they told us 25 years on, this is the room where they slept. And we also had to feed them. It's not like we had a lot of food, but we had to feed, we had to cut chickens and eat, make them food. Okay. If those, if all of those people said no, a collective no, because the society were the backbone of courage in humanity in general, simply made it for that instinctual no to be possible. We wouldn't be talking about this today. And the world would be much better. I mean, but it's not like that. It's not like that. It's a lot messier than that. Um, and so, you know, what do we do with it? Do we embrace it and say, well, you know, this is... And what lessons can we learn? I mean, I'm trying very hard to say that there is a way you can use by saying to people in my work, that language has a tremendous power to harm, to indoctrinate, to hurt, to inflict pain, to be used in surveillance, to be used as censorship. This is only language. By saying this, I am also saying that there is the power of language to declare the best of us, to inspire the best of us, to help us envision a place where we can talk ourselves out of conflicts. Now, you might say, well, you're totally crazy because, you know, how can you, how can you say these things? Because once you witness one power of language, you're hungry to witness the other power of language. And this is what I've been doing in my work for the last 30 years. It's really, really trying to hammer it out there and say, if I could have this little bit of poetic line, this little bit of story, and if I could allow myself to even think that I could live not as a victim, I hate the word victim, I don't want to be a victim, I don't want to be marked forever, I don't want to be damaged forever, I hate all of that, I hate all of that, so what's the way to work it forward, it's in language, it really is in language, I mean we are out of the country, Time has passed. Uh, my father is very old now. He is out of the prison. He has been out of the prison for many years now. The physical part is done, but what it needs to follow is the power of words to tell the story and to, and to say, but there is a way of coming up on the other side. There must be. There must be. Otherwise, we're just going to repeat the 
same old rancors and the revenge and the greed and the same language of betrayal. One of, one of the things that I I saw that you discovered in the files was a, a, a greater insight into your father's experiences in prison, because I, I can imagine he probably didn't share a lot with you about his experiences, whereas the files reveal to you much more about that. And th- there's also a link there with the power of language in terms of people in prison being creative with their use of language you know you talk about poets in in prison and writing on the wall and communicating and and also teaching each other as well yeah so i mean this is when i when i turn around and i say you know i so saw in uh 20 i think it was 2014 2013 2014 um, I, I had the tremendous privilege to go with my father and my mother and my brother and my sister into um, several of my father's prisons. And um, one of them was in Ayud, where he suffered in solitary confinement. And then we only we also went to see room 22, cell 22, where he spent um, different times, decades apart, uh, in Ayud, and where I visited him as a child. So I got the um, a chance to go to the other side. The other one was Jilava. This is before he married my mother. And Jilava has this underground tunnels. So you have sheep and dogs sort of playing out on the grass. Then you have under the ground, about 100 meters below, you go in and it's basically like graves. Some, some made with cement, some is just dirt. And so my father took us, Julava now is the museum, so you can go and visit it. They, they take tours, school tours in there, as is, as is Zarka in Ayud. And um, we went and uh, s- s- sort of talked to my father, and, and what really caught me was the writing on a wall. Um, and, and the guides were saying, and my father was saying, some of it was written in blood, some of it was scratched with the nails. You know, when people were in the rooms were just imagine a bench that you sleep at night on and then the guard wills it with the with the chain and takes it up at night and it goes against the wall and that's your walking pace and you're there. You have a little bucket to, you know, to go to the toilet there and a little thing of food that comes in and that's it. And then you go there and my father executed uh, long stints of this. For, um, in order to be forced to confess stuff that he didn't do or to punish because he tried to escape or because he said something against Gheorghe 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 Gheorghe. <laughs> you know, um, and, and, you know, on his funeral day, he said, I won't eat from his funeral cake. And then so he's got, uh, I, I forgot now exactly how many days of isolation. What I saw in there were prayers our Father who art in heaven, lines from prayers etched on the walls. And then I asked my father a bit more. Now, there is a whole tradition of this, and there are books that people were able to bring back from the prisons. Um, there are some wonderful anthologies. I have a friend who is working on those and who's also read them. Prisoners used um, the bars of soap to write with uh, discarded matches from the cigarettes that the guards, you know, would, would throw uh, up in a, in a courtyard when they were let out. And so they would write little lines, they would, do, they would draw maps, they would draw stuff that they knew and they taught each other. One of the sort of, um, my grandmother used to joke a lot that my father went to the university of, in prison. <laughs> um, but it's true. What happened is a lot of the intellectuals who stood against um, the regime um, ended up in the same cell at one point or another. And these people, in order to survive, they, uh, they, uh, they, they taught each other what they knew. And so my father taught about transistors, about radios. Um, other people taught about everything they knew, the doctors about, you know, how the body works. Uh, everybody taught something. And um, 
the other thing that they use is they would the the soles of the boots uh, okay full of dust they would spit on them and make them like uh from the saliva they would sort of dry and then you could use the either the soap or you could use the the match stick to to write on them and some of it would be lines on the walls and i was very moved by this because i thought to me it's all language right if you can't physically be outside you would conceive of yourself as a human being in words and you would put those words on a wall to remind yourself that you're a human being so the punishment that was um the harshest for intellectual people was that they were not given pen and paper in response they wrote with the soap on the walls and with blood and with chains so i found that extraordinary that's that you know there is that light inside of us that it would not be crushed and uh, that also bears sort of bringing out as a as a as a testimony my father was very proud of that you know saying you know you you learn stuff you talk to people um and uh, you know there is um again in in my memoir which i hope one day will will be published you know i wrote some anonymous po- uh, poems that i found about ayub and i put in some uh, some verses that were circulated uh, during the 1960s and then during the 1980s that i found through the through the research um again it's it's language it makes you think you know it's you you can only think in words and it's the only way to make yourself alive is to put those words somewhere that sort of image of people who are even in their darkest moments in prison are still trying to communicate and trying to be creative with whatever little tools they have they still want to be able to communicate and create words or create communication, no matter how bad the adversity is for them. Incredible. It's been a fascinating um, insight, Carmen. I really appreciate this. Well, thank you so much. Is is um, It's really wonderful. Like I said before, you know, my experience is one thing and I consider it almost visceral whereas the the lessons that I'm learning from the language of the files that that narrative this teaches me how my experience was made possible in language how it was enacted through language through those work orders and through those um through, through those portraits different portraits that they 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 put of us so um you know I take it as a big lesson about you know mistrust of authority mistrust of government and I take it as a warning I mean there are thousands and what is it millions of files now from eastern europe this is our warning that you know censoring people putting them under surveillance it's going to create loops it's not going to take us forward Carmen's book, Poetry and the Language of Oppression, is available via links in the episode notes. And don't miss Carmen's first episode with us where she talks in detail about her experiences under Romanian secret police surveillance. All links in the episode notes. Now, this podcast would not exist without our financial supporters, and I want to thank one and all of them for their generous support. If you want to help us, just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate for more information. And you can also join our Facebook group where listeners just like you continue the Cold War conversation. Thanks very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye. Goodbye.